describe how carbon dioxide is transported by the blood. If I take a test tube and take a blood sample and put it inside the test tube, I can centrifuge it. And the centrifuge is basically a really large spinning machine. And it spins the blood at around 2,000 revolutions per minute. So it spins 2,000 times every minute. And we see that blood is actually made of three different distinct layers. The first layer here are the erythrocytes, or red blood cells. The second layer here is made of platelets and white blood cells. There's a very small amount of white blood cells and platelets in the blood. And the final yellowy off white layer here is blood plasma, which is the liquid containing water and other proteins and hormones inside the blood. Now 5% of carbon dioxide carried by our blood is carried in the plasma and the plasma dissolves the carbon dioxide directly. So what about the other 95%? Well, inside the red blood cells, or erythrocytes, is a compound called haemoglobin, and haemoglobin is what binds to the oxygen to allow red blood cells to transport oxygen around the blood. And this is a ribbon diagram of haemoglobin. And this protein has four separate domains of amino acid chains. And we call these subunits. And each subunit contains a heme group here, which contains an iron ion. Now, not only can oxygen bind to hemoglobin, but carbon dioxide can also bind to hemoglobin. And this forms carbamino hemoglobin. And 10% of the total carbon dioxide carried by the blood is carried in this form, carbamino hemoglobin. So you've got 5% carried by dissolving directly in the plasma, 10% carried um, by binding to hemoglobin to form carbamino hemoglobin, and the final 85% is actually also carried in the plasma in the form of hydrogen carbonate ions. These hydrogen carbonate ions are actually formed originally inside red blood cells before they diffuse into the plasma. This diagram shows a column of tissue cells here. And of course you've got a capillary blood vessel here. And in the capillary you've got erythrocytes or red blood cells flowing through the capillary um, and they're surrounded by the blood plasma. And as the tissue cells respire, they will produce carbon dioxide and water and the carbon dioxide will be found in a higher concentration inside the tissue cell and a lower concentration inside the blood as the blood is carrying the carbon dioxide away from the tissue. So carbon dioxide will diffuse from a high concentration to a low concentration and as mentioned previously 5% will dissolve directly in the blood plasma and 10% will bind to the haemoglobin inside red blood cells to form carbamino haemoglobin. But the remaining 85% forms hydrogen carbon ions, and let's explore how that happens. Now the carbon dioxide diffuses into the red blood cell, down a concentration gradient, and the red blood cell contains an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. And this enzyme catalyzes the reaction of carbon dioxide plus water. And this forms a compound called carbonic acid, which has the formula H2CO3. Now the A-level book that you may have bought has a minus sign on this, but it doesn't actually have a minus sign, it is uncharged, there's a mistake in the book. Now the cytoplasm of the um, red blood cell contains lots of water, and the carbonic acid dissociates into two ions. Now because it's an acid, the first ion is a proton, or H plus ion, which means the second product of dissociation needs to be a negative charge to maintain the overall neutral charge of the original compound. And the remaining ion is HCO3, because one of the H's are missing, and it's given a minus charge. And that is called a hydrogen carbonate ion.
Now the hydrogen plus ions are very important and they compete with oxygen in order to bind to hemoglobin uh, and that's very important for later but for now let's focus on the hydrogen carbonate ion and as this process of reacting carbon dioxide and water to form um, carbonic acid which then dissociates into hydrogen carbonate ions as that continues over time eventually there will be a very high concentration of these hydrogen carbon ions in the blood and a much lower concentration of hydrogen carbon ions inside the plasma. So these hydrogen carbon ions actually diffuse from the red blood cell to the plasma down a concentration gradient, which means the blood plasma eventually has more and more and more hydrogen carbon ions. And we see that the carbon dioxide that was originally here is now part of a structure here. So the carbon dioxide is being carried by the plasma um, as hydrogen carbon ions and 85% of the overall carriage of carbon dioxide is carried by these ions. But if we look at the um, charges that are inside the red blood cell, what originally starts as two neutral compounds creating a neutral acid leads to the production of positive hydrogen ions which maintain a positive charge in the red blood cell but the negative charges are diffusing outside of the red blood cell so over time the blood cell starts to build up a positive charge and that's not a good thing for the proteins or the um, cell membrane inside the blood cell. So what happens is to replace the lost negative charges caused by the hydrogen carbon ions leaving, chloride ions which have a negative charge and are found inside the plasma start to diffuse into the blood cell and this maintains the overall neutral charge in the red blood cell and this is called chloride shift. Now let's talk about the hydrogen ions produced during this process and how they are important in um, the release of oxygen. As we said this process happens because the tissues are respiring and releasing carbon dioxide and this needs to be carried by the blood via hydrogen carbon ions. Now if the tissues are respiring, they're going to have an increase in carbon dioxide, which is taken away, and a decrease in oxygen. And the red blood cells need to release oxygen from the haemoglobin, which can then diffuse from the red blood cell into the plasma and eventually back into the tissues again to allow further respiration. And it's these hydrogen ions that allow that to happen. Now I've included a diagram of the haemoglobin inside a red blood cell and each subdomain or subunit of haemoglobin can contain an oxygen molecule, O2, so, and there are four domains so actually haemoglobin will contain eight oxygen atoms or four oxygen molecules. Now because there is a lower amount of oxygen in the respiring tissues because they're using oxygen to create carbon dioxide, um, the oxygen starts to dissociate from the haemoglobin and then it will start to pass from haemoglobin and diffuse into the plasma and then into the tissue. Now we also mentioned earlier that that hydrogen ions are produced inside the red blood cell um, due to the reaction of carbon dioxide and water using the enzyme carbonic anhydrase to produce hydrogen carbon ions and hydrogen ions. And these hydrogen ions can also bind with haemoglobin to form haemoglobonic acid and these hydrogen ions actually compete with the oxygen for space so when there is more carbon dioxide formed in the tissue due to high respiration there is therefore more hydrogen ion formation because of the reaction of carbon dioxide and water to form them via dissociation of uh, carbonic acid and therefore there's more competition between the oxygens and the hydrogen ions for the space in the haemoglobin and therefore as the number of hydrogen ions builds up they start to displace the oxygen. And these oxygen molecules then um, diffuse from a high concentration inside the red blood cell to a lower concentration inside the respiring tissue to provide oxygen the respiring cells.
So now we know how the hydrogen ions can compete with oxygen for space to bind to haemoglobin, we can explain the Bohr effect in the context of production of hydrogen ions. Now first of all, let's ignore the fact that we've got three separate lines. Just look at one line on its own. Um, and we see that the graph axes show the partial pressure of oxygen increasing on the x-axis and the percentage saturation of the oxygen to haemoglobin on the y-axis. And we notice it's got an S-shaped curve, which means that it increases with a low gradient at first, and the gradient increases, and then decreases again here. Now I've drawn some arrows here to simplify the diagram to show you that each arrow corresponds to one oxygen molecule binding to one heme group. So the first oxygen molecule might bind around here, and we see a relatively lower gradient of saturation of haemoglobin and the second and third oxygen molecules might bind to the second and third heme groups here and here. Now the gradient increases here, meaning it's easier to add those second and third oxygen molecules. And the final oxygen molecule is added around here. And we see a sharp decrease in the gradient, meaning it's harder to add that molecule. So obviously it means that the first and the fourth O2 molecules are relatively hard to add to haemoglobin or bind to haemoglobin, whereas the second and third oxygen molecules are easier, and we're going to try and explain why. Now the structure of a haemoglobin molecule uh, is that the heme groups are actually close to the inside of the haemoglobin molecule. They're hard to reach from the outside. So at very low partial pressures, there will not be many oxygen molecules binding to many heme groups. However, if we go from partial pressure 0 up to partial pressure of around 20, the oxygen concentration is increasing around the haemoglobin, and this means that the concentration gradient is also increasing, and we say the oxygen tension is increasing. And eventually there's so much tension that it might allow one oxygen molecule to diffuse into the haemoglobin molecule and associate with one of the heme groups and bind to it. Now when that happens it actually slightly changes the conformational structure or the shape of the haemoglobin molecule opening it up slightly and making it easier for the second and third oxygen molecules to diffuse in and bind to the second and third heme groups. And that's why you see a gradient change from the first oxygen molecule to the second and third being much deeper. However, when the haemoglobin has three oxygen molecules attached to three heme groups, it is around 75% saturated. And that means there's now a lower concentration gradient of oxygen compared to the inside of the heme group. And it's much harder for that final oxygen to diffuse in and therefore much harder for it to bind to the heme group. And this sh is shown in the graph because the S-shaped curve starts to level off or plateau and the gradient decreases. So it's much harder to add that final oxygen molecule to the haemoglobin. So the final part of the graph is the fact that there are three different curves here showing the effect of the Bohr shift. And the Bohr shift is when we increase the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, we actually end up with a shift downwards and to the right. So at low partial pressures, the S-shaped curve is here. At normal pressures, we get a slight downwards and right shift. And at very high partial pressures of carbon dioxide, we get an even further shift downwards and to the right. So to describe the graph, we could say that as the partial pressure of carbon dioxide increases from low to normal to high. This is proportional to a decrease in the overall percentage saturation of oxygen. So let's show an example of that. So if we take any value for the partial pressure of oxygen, let's say 50 here, at low partial pressure of carbon dioxide, the saturation percentage would be just under 90%. For a higher percentage of carbon dioxide partial pressure, in normal blood, it will be just under 
and for much higher levels of partial pressure in the blood of carbon dioxide, you'd have um, a reading of just over 60%. Now to explain this, we need to go back to the equation um, of carbon dioxide and water reacting with carbonic anhydrase enzymes to form carbonic acid, which then breaks down or dissociates into H plus and hydrogen carbon ions. So where there is a low amount of partial pressure carbon dioxide, this will happen very rarely. So you'll have only very few H plus ions. So because there are only small numbers of H plus ions, there'll be very little competition for space with the oxygen molecules and therefore less dissociation of oxygen. So it maintains a higher saturation of oxygen to the haemoglobin. Now where would you find a low partial pressure of carbon dioxide? Well you'd probably find that at the lungs because obviously um, carbon dioxide is being released via diffusion into the alveolar sacs and exhaled. So at the lungs there'll be very little um, dissociation of oxygen and the oxygen can be carried to the parts of the body that are respiring. Whereas places that have a high partial pressure of carbon dioxide we places that have lots of respiring tissue such as in the muscle cells of your arms or your heart and that means that there's lots of carbon dioxide and therefore lots and lots of production of carbonic acid lots of H plus ions associating and therefore lots of competition between the oxygen molecules and the H plus ions for space to bind to the heme groups and this means that the oxygen can dissociate from the haemoglobin and is free to enter the respiring tissues. So the Bohr shift is simply a shift of the oxygen saturation curve downwards and to the right and it's caused by the fact that there are far more hydrogen ions formed when there is a larger amount of carbon dioxide such as at the respiring tissues and these hydrogen ions compete with oxygen for space causing greater dissociation and therefore lower saturation levels of oxygen.